you mainly on hand guns? Doing a lot of hands, doing some hand guns stuff uh, still. Uh, got a star prep, which is quite fun. Okay. In uh, shape changing hat guns. So, yeah, because okay. I did all this shape changing stuff. all the way back to the egg. It goes back to that, yeah, but it's come a long way since then. So I developed the egg thing further when it was at Yale into these cubes. Now it's more like a kind of torch. So things are back to that. But it's, it's actually like a kind of oblong shape you hold, and it bends in the hand. Uh, okay. So it's a guiding tool. Um, so it's more two dimensional there. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So we. Um, so you get a tight grip, right? Excellent. Yeah. Super. No, so we, we got an Innovate UK grant last time. That was nice. So that kind of kick started the company in a way. Uh, I'm an academic advisor um, for the company, but I'm also a co founder. And then the company's got five full time employees now. Um, so that's great. Um, you know, they're based in London, in Bermondsey. Um, and yeah, we've got prototypes are coming along quite nicely now. So yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's good. I'm actually going to take one of our first prototypes to have the symposium when it's uh, in April. I don't know if you're going. Uh, no, I'm not. Where is it? LA. Expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's going to be expensive. But I'm a, I'm a demo co chair, so I kind of feel like I should go. You know. For some reason, <coughs> the um, Haptic Symposium has decided to look like what I'm writing anyway. So oh, no. I had a simple paper that rejected from there. So I had my, my last paper rejected as well, so. A bit longer after I'll this. Stay for the I can shift long if you want to say hi. Or meet up, uh, maybe with my guy has his own connection. He's very well connected here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to come? Yeah, I can uh, sit. Yeah. Yeah, I think Mike's sitting down there. So. Yeah. Ah, no, it's no, alright. Yeah. I'll move over. So when do you start the new position? In May, uh, May 20th. Right. I saw your post about. Looking for students, students, yeah. And I see you also here, Yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna be competing, I think. Uh, I'm fine to compete UK as long as we have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> How's it going? It's <laughs> been a long time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Reunion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got my lap. Makes your speech. Ah, the two makes the speech. The two makes the speech. We count on you. <laughs> so you are still recording a bit what you want. I'm you have interviewed. Thank you. So uh, if you look down, <laughs> if you see us looking at our sho shoelaces. <laughs> I think we just give you an indication. Sure. Brilliant. Okay, that sounds good.
Thank you. It's like teaching a class. <laughs> well, um, welcome everyone. Um, good evening. Thank you for coming. And thank you for joining us um, for Professor Ravi Vijanathan's inaugural lecture entitled Biomechatronics, Bugs, Body Parts, and Bionics. Inaugural lectures for professors are one of the most important milestones in the life of the department. So we are absolutely delighted to be here to celebrate in Ravi's success and in the department's success and in part of the department's ongoing history. It's a wonderful occasion. It's very good to have so many people here. I've met some of Ravi's family and friends and that's lovely that you've been able to come as well as many, many colleagues uh, and, a, and a real room full here actually. We actually, we have 465 people who registered for this event, which is quite a big number, isn't it? 465, um, of whom 268 in person and 197 online. So there is an online element to this, and I'll say something about that in just a minute. Before I say anything more, I should talk about the uh, evacuation procedure in the event of an alarm. So importantly to say, we, we are not expecting an alarm. There, 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 there isn't a planned alarm test. So if a, the alarm goes off, then it is intentional. If that happens, then the instructions are that we exit. Um, there are two exits here, but I strongly recommend we do this one because it's a more obvious route and there are exit marks on the way out and go out probably how most of you came in. So go out to the main entrance go out onto the footpath on Exhibition Road and go down to the junction with the college entrance just down there near the, uh, the next block, the nec at the end of the block, the south end of the block. And that's the, that's the uh, a point to gather if there's an alarm. Let's hope there won't be. But important that we have that in mind uh, if, if we need it. Um, now, I should tell you that the event is being streamed live uh, on YouTube and it's also being recorded. Uh, and after Ravi's talk, uh, there will be a Q&A time, and the Q&A will include questions from people online. So those of you who are hearing me now online, you can start thinking about your questions when Ravi's talking, and then put them in the chat, and we'll be able to bring them in to the Q&A uh, after the talk, and you'll have your chance to put your question to Ravi. So a few words of introduction before uh, Ravi speaks. Um, Ravi joined uh, Imperial College in 2012, 14 years ago. Wow, that went quickly. <laughs> Prior to that, he did his PhD uh, at Case Western Reserve University in the USA. He also held two industrial directorships as well as academic positions at the US Naval Postgraduate School uh, and at the University of Bristol. So very interesting, informative background before he came here. 
He's pioneered a range of biomechatronic systems with applications ranging across human performance, smart environments, and neuro-robotics. He's authored more than 100 refereed publications, six patents. He's been featured for innovation by groups including the Royal Academy of Engineering, the BBC, New Scientist, The Engineer, Inc. Magazine, IEEE Institute, Flight Global Magazine, The Times of India, The Discovery Channel, and The Tokyo Broadcasting Company. So quite a list of outreach, wonderful. In 2021, his work in Parkinson's disease and dementia won awards from both Google and Sony for global innovation. His research has supported the formation of four new companies in medical and consumer sectors. He's been invited to present his research at the US Pentagon, UK Parliament, and the UK Prime Minister's residence at 10 Downing Street. It's my privilege and great pleasure to invite Professor Vajanathan to give his inaugural lecture. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for that introduction, Mike. Uh, first off, I guess I'll uh, say a few short words to get started. For, um, it is not often I get a chance to talk about what I do in my office besides sleeping at my desk to so many people I'm close to, as well as such a wide range of my professional colleagues. So thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out of your evenings to be here. I'm really grateful. I guess I would add, if, if I had known we were going to start with some evacuation information, I'd have set up a robot bug to kind of point out the door and get, and, um, so it could be physically demonstrated how to move. But under, working under the assumption that that won't happen, um, I'll just say a few quick words. Um, first off, I want, we start by doing a demonstration. I'd like to introduce Dr. Zenhua Yu, who has been very tirelessly moving here for the last... <laughs> Um, so, Zenhua is actually operating this hand. You might notice it's mimicking his own hand movements. When he moves, it's following with him. I just thought a kind of straightforward, this demonstration, I shouldn't say, is not unique. I don't want to pretend it is. The way we are doing it is a little bit unique to our laboratory and a few other smaller features of that, which I'll get to later in the talk. But just by way of introduction, what has to happen when he's moving his hand for this robot hand to be able to capture and try to follow the movement. Well, first off, of course, what goes on in his own body, will, it, which um, we will briefly cover, but from the window, when you move, when you um, take a certain action, even when you concentrate and think, there are a host of signals, electrical signals, that come off of your body, as well as acoustic and other range, that can be captured that are indicative of what you're trying to do. And if we can try, so that would be if I was going to the, on the biological side of things. If we can capture them one way or another with some kind of electronic system, then we can channel them to some mechanical device for motion, hence the title of the talk in the field, Biomechatronics. So I thought just by way of introduction, if you follow, this is, um, this is an interface we've developed, which I'll be showing a few more, and it'll be set up outside after the talk if anyone wants to strap on their hand and try using it. Um, after the talk, uh, certainly feel free, that's why it's here. So I just thought by way of a kind of a broader context of what we we're going to start, I would show a quick demonstration. I should give poor Zenhua a rest. Yeah. I will say actually just not five minutes ago, Zenhua said this was rather boring and asked if he could make it do three different gestures instead of just one. <laughs> um, I guess it's a sign of my getting older that I really killed that ambition and said, just keep it to what it's doing now. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. He'll be outside with this if anyone wants to try it. So if I'm going to, OK, so my talk today, I briefly, what is biomechatronics? Uh, actually, when I start with what is, let me start with a few things I'm going to say what this talk isn't, OK, in terms of what First off, um, this is a burgeoning field. I'm sure you've seen a lot. It's getting a lot of press coverage. It's getting a lot of public attention today. It's a really exciting time to be in it. Um, I am not quite in a position 
today where I'm going to cover all the incredible work that's going on across the globe in this area today. I'll touch on a few key projects, but for the most part, I'm kind of describing my own journey, and almost all the projects I'm going to be talking about are things I've worked on. I'm not claiming them as any pinnacle in their field, simply if I've worked on them, I know enough to talk about it. So that's really, uh, secondly, it is a diverse field as we're combining biology, um, electronics, mechanics, and a few other areas. As a part of that, I'm going to be going into some of these areas. I should warn you, I am trained as an engineer. A third of my PhD happened to be in neuroscience, but the way I kind of qualify that is if a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, I'm a really, really dangerous neurologist. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best when it comes to that material. I'm also kind of nervous because I do have some very renowned neurologists in the audience. And so if I do make any mistakes, I'm sure they can correct me beyond that. But I will do my best to kind of cover it in my con the context here. I guess other I was talking about whether um, I was asked a few times how, whether I was at all anxious about this talk. I, my answer ended up, I'm, I'm usually not, I speak to other academics every day, even some, certainly clinicians, sometimes even politicians and industrialists. I'm pretty nervous when my daughter's in the audience. <laughs> so the short answer was yes. <laughs> so, um, what, so today what I'm going to cover, I briefly will kind of cover what biomechatronics is. I'll kind of cover philosophically some of the things that are going on in the field that motivated us to carry forward. These are just some of the devices that are developed in my lab that um, I'll be talking about. Uh, I got into this field by studying insects, and specifically insect neurobiology and insect mobility. So hence, the first part of the conversation will be on bugs. Uh, maybe I should put a small disclaimer here to say that if anyone is disturbed by videos or of bugs, the, there will be some. Uh, then I'll go into some of our human-robot interface, particularly prosthetic limbs. We've done a lot of work in artificial limbs, and I'll talk about how we could, how at least in my case, the insect neurobiology helped that. And then we'll talk about some of the augmentation, which is the core of our work right now, where we're looking at mechatronic systems to help with stroke, Parkinson's disease, tremor, and dementia. And I'll close with a few reflections, hopefully open to questions and discussion. I will say normally, when I give a talk, I like to open it up to questions as we go. I'm really not that fond of hearing the sound of my own voice for the next 45 minutes, unless we're all at a pub, then I can keep going for hours. But um, uh, I will do my best to keep it engaging. And uh, again, please, if anyone has any questions, I'm delighted to take them at the end of the talk. So the first um, experiment I want to talk about is one I had nothing whatsoever to do with. Okay, this was done in the laboratory of Professor Bob Full at the University of Berkeley. Uh, Professor Full is a very, very renowned insect neurobiologist and studying how insect neurobiology can be used to create balancing robots. So he did an experiment that I read, I was aware of the work as a student, uh, that really changed the way I looked at this field and guide a lot of what I'm doing right now. So I thought I'd open with starting um, to describe this experiment. So what Professor Full did was he took a cockroach and he super glued a cannon to its back. Okay, I'm not speaking metaphorically, literally. That is a cockroach, that is a cannon on its back, the cannon is firing a bolt. Okay, so let's say I've got, so here's the cockroach, it's running right towards you. It's running forward, this cannon on its back fires a bolt that way. What should happen to the cockroach? it'd be pushed this away by recoil. Okay, why would a world famous neurobiologist do this unless he had just been kind of gone off the deep end with exposure to cockroaches? <laughs> All right, what Bob was trying to test was he, was he was trying to perturb the insect. He wanted to perturb it and see how it balances. So, you know, if I'm standing here, if someone pushes on me, what happens if, for me to maintain my balance? Well, something has to sense I'm pu being pushed on. Um, that's going to create some kind of signal. Um, nerve cells was here would be my, end up going to my brachial plexus. Eventually, a signal is going to get to my brain. That's going to say, okay, do I stiffen up my body to push back? Do I move some muscles over to come out? How do I do it? So there's a whole series of loops that need to be closed from the perspective of control to make that 
seemingly simple behavior actually work because it's quite a complex reaction. Now what Professor Full was doing, why he was using a cannon, was because he wanted to perturb the insect so fast that he could actually rule out its nervous system. My own PhD was actually modeling the uh, escape, neural escape response of a cockroach when it dodges a predator. And when a cockroach dodges a predator, uh, it dodges because wind lunges towards it. When wind comes towards it, it dodges away from the wind. If um, the biologist I was working for, Roy Richmond, if you blow wind at a cockroach that's standing still, it will dodge in about 60 thousandths of a second. Okay, that's pretty fast. It's, um, it's got to take all the stuff I had mentioned that Zenhua was doing in terms of integrating that information, turning it into a response, and control what amounts to 49 degrees of freedom. But if the cockroach is moving, that reaction time goes down to 14 thousandths of a second. Okay, so simplistically speaking, Let's say, OK, um, you know, you've seen muscles are a little sluggish when you first move. But if you are already moving, you can get a faster reaction. So let's simplistically say of that 46 milliseconds, 14 is the nervous system response. Okay? Bob wanted to perturb that cockroach faster than 14 milliseconds. Because that way he could kind of rule out the reaction of the nervous system and see the entire response. Does that make sense? So that's why he used a cannon. Um, aside from perhaps some visual effect. So, what happened? Well, in a video of how the animal reacted, he figured out the can was impacting a normal force of less than 10 milliseconds, which should be fast, 10 thousandths of a second, which should be faster than the insect's capable of reacting. And you can see the cockroach doesn't, I mean, it wobbled a little bit, doesn't seem particularly perturbed. So, what's going on there? The co I mean, his, the postdoctoral fellow, Devin Jindrich, who, po who um, authored that paper, I was lucky enough that my own PhD supervisor knew Professor Full and had some conversation. He was quoted saying the cockroach didn't even break stride. So, if the reaction is actually, if, if, they're correct about the time speed of that reaction, that the nervous system shouldn't have been able to react quite that quickly. What's going on? What's happening? And how does it work? So, one of the, um, this had been written about several times, the, the phenomenon. Reading this particular paper changed the way I looked at things. And um, again, being fortunate to work in a lab which had some connections to the group that did it. What's happening there is, there are a whole series of mechanical properties within the biological organism. Every muscle in your body is a spring. Okay? I mean, if you were standing still, um, you know, if, the per if you just tensed up and the person next to you pushed, you wouldn't move. If you relaxed without moving, you would move. Every muscle in your body is a spring. Um, you are not, when you don't, you control the stiffness of that spring when you move, you control its shock absorption. And those create a whole series of responses that actually help stabilize your body. And so what you're seeing with that cockroach was a very sophisticated mechanical response to this perturbation that should have been faster than its nervous system should have been able to react. And so this, very, this mechanical response kind of then works in concert with the nervous system, so it appears pretty seamless. So the whole idea is, um, so, and again, this. This was being discussed many times, but I don't, I'm not, to me this was a quite a striking demonstration of what happened. And it was published in the Journal of Experimental Biology in 2002. And the mechanical properties of the biological organism augment its neural control. So the term actually, it was a little bit new then, now it's bounced around quite a bit, a so-called so neuromechanical system. So what we're talking about is the fusion of the skeletal system, the muscular system, and the nervous system. Okay? Every nerve cell in your body is a small electrical circuit. Every muscle in your body is an actuator that creates force. I mean, a form of a motor, I mean, not, uh, maybe a linear motor, of course. And your skeletal system and your tendons and your ligaments are straight mechanical structures that have spring damping. And these, all of these are tuned in concert with one another. So that's why 
um, the kind of motion that we see biological organisms exhibit is so smooth and why it's so difficult to replace when we look at robotic systems. When we're talking about artificial limbs, when we're talking about balancing robots, which was the purpose of this experiment, when we're talking about even understanding conditions like Parkinson's disease where someone doesn't move. It's that core ability to modulate the stiffness of your system. So there's so many people in this field, in some ways I'm pretty happy being a mechanical engineer fundamentally because I see everything in the world as a spring. And, um, uh, but from my viewpoint, and again there's actually, um, uh, actually my, my colleague Chen Burday here was lucky enough to be in the audience for me, he published some major seminal works on how impedance control of the body and specific modulation of that stiffness is critical to every movement you make. So um, while I was, again, while I was studying neuroscience and engineering, this was what kind of put it, closed the loop in my own head, where I'm saying, okay, we need to, the electrical system and the mechanical system and the control system are inherently coupled. They all feed off of each other in different ways. And that's, and we can look at how the biological system behaves for inspiration to create kind of robotic systems in medicine or engineering for it. So that was what uh, the paper that, again, so that was sort of my introduction. Now this is an experiment done by Professor Roy Ritzman. Uh, I was lucky enough to work under Professor Ritzman. He's a neuro another insect neurobiologist at Case Western Reserve. Um, he, this is a cockroach climbing up a 45 degree slope. Now, um, what Roy is, obviously, if you've seen one of these things you move, that, that is severely slowed down. <laughs> it's a lot faster. So it is climbing up that slope, and you can see it's more or less moving pretty smoothly. It's taking a 45-degree incline without any trouble. There is not a legged robot in the world that could handle an incline like that that smoothly. And even a wheeled or crawling robot, maybe if its center of gravity was low enough, could handle, but then it wouldn't be able to get over a small step. So what's going on there in terms of how this thing behaves? So now this is that same species of cockroach. It is approaching that same incline, but it is doing so, you'll have to take my word for it on this, it is doing so without its brain. Okay? If you decapitate a cockroach, Again, not speaking metaphorically, speaking literally. If you decapitate a cockroach, it's most likely to die of starvation. OK? Think about that from an engineering perspective. You, you took away its central computing system, its brain. You took away a lot of its sensors, its antenna, very important, its eyes, its ears, they disappeared. You put it through a fair amount of trauma. And it more or less keeps going until its battery runs out, but needs to eat. So what Roy has done here, actually, he has lesioned this co particular cockroach, so its brain more or less isn't talking to its body. So he didn't actually decapitate it, but this cockroach, its brain, it is walking without a brain. And it is still getting farther than any legged robot we have in the world today. And it's still t starting to take that slope, although eventually it does kind of have some issues. <laughs> so think about that for a moment, though. Um, what was going on in its joints, in the nervous system here, its local, the nerve cells there, such that it got that far, it was balancing reasonably well. It was probably, I mean, I, I don't want to speculate, going back to the dangerous comments, I don't want to speculate too much on what was going on there neurologically. But it, I can say, from a control perspective, it was balancing reasonably well, and it was doing so based on an entirely distributed kind of system until it got to it. So that led to, this is a robot that I was worked on, I was as a part of a larger team, I was a small part of a larger team, in my PhD supervisor's lab, Professor Roger Quinn. Um, this is uh, the version, the simplified, so that is a 17 to 1 scale cockroach, okay? It is um, American cockroach, joints measured, scaled up 17, uh, 17 times. Um, it is, uh, it was designed essentially to go where people can't, for, where, for danger reasons, for example, power plants, for example, uh, looking for um, shallow water mines on a beach was a major application for it. So this is the robot. It is 
moving reason, well, now, what you're going to see next here is done by uh, Dr. Gabe Nelson, um, a guy I did my PhD with. He's pushing on the cockroach. I guess, in a simplistic way, you could say that was our version of the cannon of the cockroach experiment, because this was slow enough you could just push it. Um, but he's pushing on it, and you're seeing it maintain its balance. I, I, without getting too much into details of the system, it was using pneumatic cylinders, compressed air, to act like springs. So that bouncing. So when you saw Gabe pushing on it and it bouncing, imagine if that was walking over some challenging surfaces. That balance preserving reflex, part of which was embedded in the mechanical structure because of the way it was designed, um, and its ability, although it was a little tricky, it was trying to modulate, again, when I mentioned the stiffness control of your muscles, it was, there was some effort to try to maintain, change its stiffness by changing air pressure in the cylinder. So again, this was a long way from an actual, um, you know, moving it anywhere near the insect would. But it was actually quite a breakthrough at, in the sense that it was looking at that stiffness modulation, studying and understanding it, and actually trying to create a distributed system to create a balance similar to what you saw earlier. And like I said, this was done in Professor Roger Quinn, my PhD advisor's lab. So now, uh, actually, and. Um, uh, for the people online, I'm sorry, I do need to turn the video away because I'm showing some medical information that can't stream out on the web. It can stay in this room, though. Okay, so hopefully you're still hearing. So just to kind of, so I don't leave everyone with the impression that all I look at are bugs. Um, this is a surgery done here on campus by Professor Deep Kunar Nandi. Um, this is a deep brain stimulation surgery which is done for, um, in this case, on someone who has Parkinson's disease. Um, now you can see uh, she has tremor there. She's shaking quite badly. What Deep is going to do, he's actually um, putting a small electrode into her brain. Um, essentially, he's putting it in the ventral intermediate nucleus. If you sort of draw a line between my, where my fingers are, the meeting point of that line would be very close to where he's putting the electrode in her brain. And um, again, if you think about, say, tremor, just if you hold your arm and just keep, just don't move it, but stiffen it, stiffen it, stiffen it, it'll start to shake a little bit. That ability, if, or if your calf is tightened up at night. You ever, I mean, you ever had your calf cinch up at night suddenly very painful? Your leg isn't actually moving, but you have to, that's, again, that stiffness. You're not modulating that stiffness well, so it creates. So this is pretty core to a lot of what's going on, I believe, what, a lot of what's going on with um, people um, with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. So you're going to see in this case, she's, this patient, she has bad um, shaking. And so Deep is going to put in an electrode into the ventral intermediate nucleus of her brain. And he's going to start giving, he's modulating the frequency, the contact points, and the amplitude that he's stimulating. And so, and now we're seeing um, what happens immediately afterwards. And, uh, one of the challenges with this particular procedure for Parkinson's disease, however, is that doctors more or less eyeball the right level of current, right level of um, amplitude, the right level of contact point to give that. One of the things, we're, if we could understand the stiffness phenomenon, understand the muscle behavior a little bit better, we might be able to adjust that. So that's the kind of the big picture of what we're looking, what um, I explore, and hopefully that made some sense. I know it's going to, uh, it, um, it is a rather eclectic field, and um, I ha I'm working on a lot of different projects, and it's probably because many, many people believe I have attention deficit disorder. But I, I, I'm going to try to convince you there is some cohesion to this. Whether or not you believe me, you can settle at the end of the talk. But that's fundamentally the set of reactions we're looking for, uh, at least that I'm trying to look at through the range of projects I'm going to go through next. So the rest I'll kind of go by example. So if I'm looking at, this was actually a rough summary in a paper, another paper I read a student by Brown, where if we look at kind of what happens when we move in, when we want to reproduce it with robotic systems, well, think of this as if I put time on a y-axis, with time at the lowest end here, what happens when I'm perturbed? 
Well, first there's that mechanical response. My muscles are springs and dampers. There's damping in my ligaments. There, my tendon is a spring. There's a mechanical response that precedes the um, precedes a, rea a reaction from the nervous system. Now, as that mechanical response, the first change to that could be, for example, rather than I actually coordinate my muscle to push back, which might take a little longer, I stiffen something. I change its stiffness. I make it less or more stiff. Okay, that's the overlapping area between the next level. And then eventually I have some local reflexive control, which is going to direct some movement. Then eventually that's going to get up to a higher level where the brain is going to make some conscious direction. And so this is a gross, gross simplification. But from a big picture perspective, um, again, there was a paper, I, if anyone cares, I can maybe link it off the, um, off the uh, site. It was a really nice paper I read just when I was finishing my PhD by Brown that um, kind of tried to summarize on a very high level what goes on. And if you're looking at a big picture view of how this fits together from a design perspective for a robot or something. And so the majority of my work uh, is falling in this overlapping area between the mechanics. Because what happens for that mechanical reaction versus the nervous system reaction? What's going on in that area? Uh, and can we modulate that to create smoother systems for medicine and balancing robots? Uh, and actually, more recently, we've actually got up to higher levels in terms of using the same analysis for other areas like cognitive disorders as well. But this is where my fundamental education was. So the fields of application are biologically inspired robotics, um, design fabrication of inspired machines and systems, and cybernetics, where we're developing devices that can act on or substitute parts of the body for surgery, prosthetics, or personal assistance. So now I'll, I'll just, you'd seen some videos of cockroaches already. There's cockroaches and dragonflies that were studied in, with Stuart Burgess at the University of Bristol and Roy Ritzman, who's an insect neurobiologist at Case. That led to, this was a robot I actually built for my master's thesis. Um, this was a robot sea slug. Oops, sorry. Uh, that is um, a Mandusa instar, insect larvae. Entirely soft-bodied creature. This is a robot I built. Again, this was my master's thesis. We published it in 2000, where we built a robot. It was, the idea was for something entirely soft body, a purely muscular structure. Interestingly enough, soft robotics is a huge field right now. There's an entire journal devoted to it. It's being used in medical, uh, a range of different medical and mobile robotic applications. But in, um, at, when I presented this at the International Conference of Robotics and Automation when I was a master's student in 98, uh, I, the chair of the session said this was something entirely new. Um, I don't know if it was in specifically the first entirely soft-bodied robot, but at the time, it was one of the first attempts at this area. And we were doing it by, again, we tried to, we, the model we used was a caterpillar. The other one we at least studied a little bit was a tongue, um, because your tongue is an entirely muscular structure. It's a soft-bodied structure that can bow a little bit. So that was published. That was my master's advisor, Hillel Cheel, and that was me in, in 2000 when the paper was published. So from there, uh, I worked closely with, on a range of projects at my PhD supervisor lab, um, Roger Quinn. This was a design that we actually um, participated. It was a modified design of the cockroach robot that was a little more practical. Um, the idea was a robot that could go through a range of search and exploration, uh, may, again, it, looking for just trying to get places where people can't to avoid danger. And uh, at the time, even now, there are not many robots that were capable of this level of mobility that came out of Professor Quinn's lab. Um, that robot, you know, it's happily charging down some stairs. You saw it smoothless, sm smoothly move over a curb that was actually taller than the robot itself. And um, here it is going up those same set of stairs. I'm happy to go into details and question answers. There was, we modified the design quite a bit. You can see it has a rotating device, not a pure leg. But we paid a lot of attention to how we use springs in the axle of this device to try to reproduce some of the stiffness changes I was talking about 
which uh, really did help that robot with its balance in terms of being able to climb over objects that were larger than itself. And uh, cockroach has a joint a third of the way down its body in its thorax. We put a joint at the same place on this particular robot so that it really, it basically passively can control its center of gravity when it climbs, when it goes over devices like that. And we published a range of papers on that. So that actually led to this next robot is, it's down here. That is the size of an actual cockroach. But I need to admit that is the largest cockroach in the world I'm comparing it to. <laughs> the cockroach's name is Blabrus giganteus. It's the Madagascar hissing cockroach. But it, this robot was the same size as that cockroach. And in body lengths per second when it was built, again, that was in Professor Quinn's lab again where I was working. <coughs> Excuse me. It was the fastest legged robot in the world at the time in body lengths per second. And now actually there are a couple other faster legged robots, but its climbing is still pretty, um, uh, has set a pretty good bar. I mean, you saw it climbing over objects that were taller than itself. It's pretty tough. It can fall down a flight of stairs. Now, if an insect had to go up those stairs, what would it do? Jump? That's a click beetle. <laughs> Look at that thing jump. I'm not sure if I have a four inch vertical. <laughs> and what happens when you jump stiff, you, your muscles store and energy, store and release energy like springs. So there was a mechanism here that wound a spring that let that robot jump when it reached an object. And from there, that actually led to a robot we called the Morphing Microair Land Vehicle. This was developed in a, a combined project between Case Western Reserve and when I was a, um, working at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Um, this robot, and it's, out, the, it's, skele I, its skeleton is outside. You can see some of these robots outside. They're not running at a display. This particular robot was, in my understanding, the first handheld robot that could fly, land, and crawl in a single sequence. Uh, Tokyo Broadcasting Systems did a special on it specifically because of that. So you saw that was a US Marine who deployed it. He just tossed it. In this case, it was looking for um, a car that had a suspected bomb in it. And this was a live field exercise. So it was chasing this car. It flew, landed, and crawled, and went under the car and tried to see what it could find. And in this case, It did find something. Again, this was a mock experiment, but in that particular experiment, it was deployed by a US machine in a live field exercise. It didn't know what it was going to find. It chased this car. It flew land and crawled under it and got a signal through a daisy chain of communications seven miles away to warn someone that that was a car. And you saw you had to toss to have it fly, but this was just a part that just something I loved, so I put it in the video. Um, it, it did need to be thrown to fly, but if it crawled off a building, it could hop building to building by flying off. And you can see it actually, um, it was done by studying kind of the same cockroach walking mechanisms and the kind of, again, flexibility of bat's wings was how it was designed. If anyone's interested, you can see the, that robot outside. You can check, look at its wings and compare it to a bird or bat. So that's it for bugs. Body parts. If I could, let me try to... An incredible moment. The memory uh, of the hand apologize. he lost. This is a clip from ITV News, which is just, I'm tired of talking. We have assessed the potential for use of subject it's independent... It's an incredible and moment. And the memory of the hand he lost, moving a robotic hand. Hand. Hand left. Thumb to forefinger. Thumb right. A wonderful breakthrough for a man who had all yeah. four limbs amputated and for the team of scientists who've made it possible. Basically, he's tensing the muscles he has left in his res residual limb, um, and as the muscles contract, they make a noise, and we just have a microphone sitting on his arm uh, that picks up that signal, and we process it to move the hand. So what is it like operating a, f a phantom hand? Very surreal, very surreal. As amputees, we tend to get phantom pain anyway, so sometimes I might be lying in bed at night and I can feel uh, my hands itching. Whereas now, coming here, uh, me trying to um, emulate that and seeing the hand open and close is quite bizarre. Um, so actually, that was a project. Uh, 
done, this was the team, of course, Alex, an incredible gentleman, he was the one who was op actually operating. I can't tell you how much it changed our research when he got involved with working with us. He's is missing both his arms and legs and has an incredible spirit, just so inspiring to all of us and very, very intelligent. Um, Sam Wilson, whom you heard interviewed, is now the CTO of our spin-out company. Richard Woodward, who has um, come here from Vienna, I had not seen in, how long was it? Long enough, I haven't, don't remember, but he pioneered the base system that was making that work, and he's here today. And Panipat Watansari, just to cover the range of it, just finished his doctorate uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's been a range of things going, and that was what Zenhua was showing off here. I should stress the results in the motion are not unique. There are other systems that can do that. They're all based on electromyography, however. The fact that we're doing it off the vibrations of the muscle, divorcing us the need from us, um, from an electrical connection to the skin opens a lot of doors. I'm happy to answer further questions on that. So from there, actually, I will go ahead. We, in Richard's work, whom I showed you before, he actually carried that out um, to see how amputee Le to cure an amputee leg movement. One of the things about this way of muscle measuring muscle like that, it has a lot of drawbacks. I don't want to oversell it, and I'm very happy to go into those if anyone should. But one of the major advantages is it's very easy to use. And so we actually had a, um, a young man who was missing a leg who was kind enough to volunteer for a study with us. And he wore this sensor, because one of the major issues when you have a prosthetic leg is what is the activity of your good leg. For example, um, many people who lose limbs are in their 20s and 30s. And they actually end up developing, if it's a leg, they end up developing arthritis in their 40s and 50s because they put so much pressure on that leg. If we understood how they walk better, understood the muscle activity, we could know, but it's hard to get this to work outside the lab. This was one of the first times eight hours straight of recording was done on an amputee to see the muscle activity so we could kind of understand that. That was based on Richard's work. Um, this was a project done by, um, by a really sharp student, uh, very proud of, named Felix Russell. He actually built a robot knee. He kind of combined what I was talking about with, well, um, instead of cockroaches, he was actually studying human beings, which was nice. Um, but he combined that with a lot of the stiffness studies, and he built a robot knee. But in this case, while we do hope maybe someday it could be a better knee for people who are missing legs, the real purpose was actually trying to understand how um, ultimately, it comes down to stiffness, but how ligament damage in the knee can affect your movement. Uh, because you can't really study ligament damage that way. I'm not exactly going to grab Richard, strain his ligament, and whip him until he walks and see if he falls over. And I can't do it on a cadaver either. So he actually built a robot knee that was very anatomically correct. And we tried different stiffness kind of bands in the place of ligaments. Then we snipped them, we stretched them, and saw how the knee moved so we could understand, in the long run, maybe understand how we could, uh, um, the co course of ligament damage. And, but uh, we did find some interesting things even in the short term. He published a wonderful paper showing how the knee maintains mechanical advantage even when the anterior cruciate is strained that way. And um, this led to a broader human machine interface system, which I'll let the video play. This video was made by Sam Wilson also, who you heard in. Uh, we'll also have a version of this video game outside if anyone wants to try it after the talk. And this is Alex Lewis, he's playing that video game without his hand.
time channel surfing. Oh, we didn't get to talk about the top right. He's remote controlling a robot with the same interface. He's wearing it and it's mapping his movements. So that was basically Sam's PhD. <laughs> so now finally I'll close with a few words on bionics. I'll keep it short. This is a BBC News clip. Jerry Lambert had a stroke 15 years ago, which left her with no feeling down her right hand side. Suddenly, the simple things became much harder. A struggle to sip a glass of water or make a cup of tea. I'd gone from being quite independent to suddenly I'm dependent on other people making me tea, coffee, um, making me a meal. And that was quite upsetting. Jerry's now working with scientists who have developed this exoskeleton that could totally change the lives of stroke patients felt very strange at first because I wanted to control what I was doing with it, but it wasn't. It was the glove that was doing things for me. Triggered by sensors, controlled by a computer. This robotic helper can be made using a 3D printer in just a couple of days. It picks up on... Now, with respect to this field, I have to mention, this is a burgeoning field. There are many devices that are trying to do something similar. Uh, a few of the smaller aspects of this device that were unique were how it captured thumb motion and certain stroke exercises, but you'll find a wide range of similar devices out there, just to be clear. Also, if we, we want to pilot controlling it off our, the muscle sensor I mentioned, which would be a little unique, but we haven't done that yet. So. Um, We've carried that forward, the project going on right now with uh, Sharp PhD student named Chris Kalkurik and being extended by uh, a PhD student named Annika Wes, who is in Singapore extending this work right now to, for lower limb assistive devices. This also, this entire skeleton frame, which is helping someone, was built in the lab of Samir Mohammed at University Paris SD Canal. So as we summarize this, and I'll close out with some of our translations, we have kind of got to the point where some of this, what I mentioned about, is getting to, to reach patients and actually helping people's homes. We've coupled all this material together, the muscle sensing, the motion tracking, the interface for a home system in Parkinson's. That, the university's patented that. That patent is exclusively licensed to a company called Surge Technology, which Sam Wilson, whom you heard interviewed, is the chief technology officer of that company. And they've got this in about 100 homes right now, and it's being trialed, hopefully, to help people with Parkinson's on a larger scale. Um, we published a paper um, summarizing some of this in time ago, which we're um, I'm quite proud of anyway. It was, a, one of the, it was the first system to sense all three cardinal systems of Parkinson's in one wearable, and which was the core of the patent. Um, and that's actually being carried forward into a wearable tremor control system where we're using, you can see, if you run electrical current into a muscle, besides the muscle producing, you know, measuring, you can actually, um, you can actually do things like suppress tremor. This is poor Sam again. We're running current into his muscle till he thrashes. And, um, but we're able to measure the response with our sensor and closed loop, and that's becoming a closed loop tremor control system. We're hoping it could be a wearable that could help people with tremor. Um, and so from there, we actually moved on to human performance, where uh, our motion tracking work has become a set of smart boxing gloves. That's a professional martial arts fighter who's testing them out. You can see every punch he throws is being tracked by that. Um, on his phone. The same kind of motion else we're doing. And on the top right, I don't know if anyone recognizes who's in that picture. Um, that's Anthony Joshua. He's with my student Charlie Burr and Jerry Krylov. They've founded a company called Corner. That boxing system is for sale across the globe right now. Uh, if anyone wants to try it, it's outside. And we have boxing pads and those for you to try them out if anyone's interested. Um, so uh, I'll very briefly go. That's led to a project where we're actually developing a wearable device to monitor um, a baby kicking for an expectant mother. This was really an offshoot. Or it's not looking at the fundamental muscle activity, but it's become a reasonable project right now. That's a, um, a volunteer who was kind enough to test it for us. 
she, essentially, she's wearing this device. And again, it's outside. I don't know if anyone's actually expecting a baby, but if you, <laughs> but if you want to tap it, you can see it work. Because <laughs> um, uh, there are a whole, whole range of prenatal um, health conditions if we knew an accurate count of a baby's movement. In fact, there's a huge debate in the medical community, which I know absolutely nothing about. Um, I, I only came in for the instrumentation. I hope my colleague, Chris, please. Actually, um, uh, the, the um, clinical lead researcher on the Sohini Patel is in the audience here. You can ask her any specific questions about that. But it could, we're looking at it to prevent stillbirth. So we've got the system where we took our sensing technology that we developed for other applications, made this wearable device. You can wear it. Um, it will hopefully be detecting what a baby kicks. You plug it into a computer to recharge. A cloud automatically gets it. We can pull the data and see how the baby's doing. And I'm going to, as I'm coming to a close, this is actually the project I'm probably the most excited about in my lab right now. It's at the Dementia Research Institute, Care Research and Technology Center. It's led by Professor David Sharp and um, with um, co-led by Professor Pai and Barnaji. Uh, and my colleague, Professor Paresh Malothro, has published a couple of papers. This is a huge project with a really, really powerful vision of making smart homes to the point where they can help clinically, um, they can help with activities of daily living, they can help with monitoring for dementia, people living with dementia. My own role in this is developing a robotic intelligence where we're trying to summarize the machine learning and artificial intelligence as well as the signal processing and understanding of movement to come together to have kind of a voice that talks to the pa that helps people living with dementia get through their day and gets medical information from them. If anyone is interested in piloting a small s system with this, um, Anthony Eden is our, he's actually got he's working on a questionnaire where an artificial intelligence system tries to talk to medical patients and get because you fill out surveys saying how do I feel today. I feel good today, agree, disagree, like that doesn't give you much information. Um, so Anthony's trying to develop a system that can have conversations. So if anyone wants to try it out, he'll be demoing that. It will be in here because it'll be talking. We can't do it in a crowded room. So it'll be in this room here. Um, so I guess with that, I will kind of close. This is a diagram that my, one of my first ever students, Mike Mace, put together in about 2013 or 14, I think. Um, he doesn't remember either. So, but it was interesting because I kind of had a conversation with Mike to say, okay, where could all of this go? And he put this, which seemed like a future vision, seemed a little bit um, aspirational and pie in the sky, but uh, the idea was you have some kind of health sensitive where it's picking up signals inside the brain, picking up signals off the body, and maybe getting them to a robot that would help if someone's having trouble walking, someone's having Parkinson's. And the interesting thing about this is since that time, we actually have most of these in individual pieces. So it has been an interesting time since, um, uh, I mean, based on, you know, Mike created a great foundation, it's grown since then. So. It, it really kind of seemed like an odd bit of a drunken vision that we had at that moment, but it, parts are coming together, and perhaps it could happen at some point. So I'll close saying a few translation um, um, work in our, with our industrial connections. Wearables, I'd mentioned Surge Technologies. They've, they're commercializing the Parkinson's system, and they've got it in a range of homes. They've, raised, they've gone through some investment and are doing quite well. Um, Athletech is... Um, the parent company, it's actually called Corner, that's doing the smart boxing system, Corner, like boxing in your corner. Again, that's outside if anyone wants to try it. Um, based on some of the work we did with emotional robots uh, for dementia patients, a company called Emotix, they've released, without, um, without me being involved, they've released a robot that, I know it sounds odd, but it, the purpose of that robot is to wander around your house and remind kids to do their homework. And, um, and maybe you have football practice or something. Um, I've, um, I've been lucky enough to become on, a, on their advisory board. It is for sale around the world. There's one outside if anyone wants to try talking to it. So um, let me look. Uh, when, when I was first interviewed by the university about uh, 
about being lucky enough for the promotion, the first thing I said was in an interdisciplinary field, there's no such thing as an individual. Okay, uh, this is a multi. I lean very, very heavily on people with outside expertise, but these are the people I thoroughly lean on. I wasn't able to highlight all of their names. I tried to put some pictures up, but this is the team of researchers that have come out of our lab in the last few years, and um, you know, there's a small fable which really describes this. There's a, okay, a professor, a postdoctoral fellow, and a PhD student are walking through a park. Their eyes simultaneously fall on an old oil lamp. All three of them reach for the lamp and pick it up. A genie pops out of the lamp. The genie looks a little confused, says, look, normally I give someone three wishes. There are three of you, each of you gets one wish. Uh, what else? So the PhD student says, me first, says, what would you like? He said, I want a hundred room mansion. I want a hundred of the most beautiful people in the world to be in that mansion with me. I want enough food and drink to last for an entire lifetime. The genie says, of course, he disappears. The postdoc screams, me next, me next. Says, okay, what would you like? I want a 200 room yacht. I want 200 of the most beautiful people in the world to be on that yacht. I want enough food, drink to last two lifetimes while that yacht goes around the world. And the genie says, your wish is my command. Poof, he disappears. He turns to the professor and says, I guess you're gonna top that. The professor thinks about it a moment and says, yeah, I'd like those two back in the lab by lunch. <laughs> But the point is how much the work is done, the reliance is there, I am nothing without them, is the, is the moral of that story. So thank you for all of them. I'm so, great to see a few faces I hadn't in a while. Um, we've been marginally in touch so you can see where it's going. But as I said, that is where all of the work is being done. Collaborators, I have to mention, um, there are way too many thank yous for me to possibly give here. Um, I'll start with my PhD supervisor, Roger Quinn at Case Western. Roy Ritzman was an insect neurobiologist who, got, who I b b saw cockroaches with. Um, Professor Xiaoping Yun and Captain Jeff Klein at the Naval Postgraduate School. That was really my first position after my PhD. I was, uh, I, I was a bit of a postdoc. Both of them were really, really incredible supervisors to me. Professor Lalit Gupta at Southern Illinois University, who kind of just took me under a wing without really knowing me, without a direct research connection, and we started doing a great deal of work together. Uh, it was his interaction that kind of took me from, in my view, just being a traditional mechanical engineer to looking at these broader issues in terms of pattern recognition. The rest, I mean, God, there's um, Allison uh, McGregor, first person I met at Imperial and in the medical school. I wouldn't have done anything without her. Dario Farina is one here. Uh, he, he, is not a he is not dangerous when it comes to neurobiology as an engineer. And, um, I'm in awe of what is knowledge. Deep Kanar is a surgery. Paul Bentley, we're doing a lot of work together on pain. David Sharp and Presh Malhotra, I'd mentioned, and Payan Barnagi, I'd mentioned, they're in the Dementia Research Care Re Technology Center. Several other names here. I'll highlight William Harwin because he was kind enough to come down here today from Reading. And I also want to thank Martin Levelsley for being here from Leeds. Martin, uh, we haven't actually worked together, but l when I was first trying to move to this country, we just established e email contact, and he gave me a lot of guidance on trying to come here in the first place. Um, so look, I, there are too many to specifically go into, but I did want to specifically say a thank you to Ferdinando Rodriguez y Baena. Uh, I don't think I'd be accused of spreading tales by, say, my boss if I said I'm not the most organized person in the world. <laughs> And Ferdy and I had shared a lab for eight years. And when something went on in that lab, as in our paperwork wasn't up to date, there, we needed a new seating shot, every time it was him doing it so I could do work. And after one of the instances where Ferdy, Ferdy had done a great deal in organizing that lab, and I had said, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. He, he gives me all kinds of drawups of wisdom. This is one I have to take home, though. <laughs> because whatever Ferdy went through is a thousand times worse at home. <laughs> so. Uh. So 
look, I don't know where, whether Uthra was born with this capacity to deal with this, or if it was forced on her due to other events in life. <laughs> but obviously, I, don't, I mean, it's, it's an easy cliche, but uh, there's no way. I, I wouldn't have even applied to a university of this caliber if it hadn't been for her. I really wouldn't have. So, thank you. Now, the other thank you, actually, her career direction has changed, but my daughter, Sahana, I will always remember this quote at age four. And she has helped me with research. <laughs> on many occasions. <laughs> so, and it's come a long way since then. So, closing thoughts. Uh, I guess I've been asked a few times, um, both in the press and personally, you know, what made me want to do work in this field, what intrigued me, an engineer with biological connections. Well, that's what I wanted to do for a living. <laughs> that actually is me in the back of the raft. It was my first academic position. The two people there are my first ever PhD. They weren't PhD students, my first two first students. I took them on a kind of field trip at the end of the term. <laughs> And I was in the process of completing a certification to teach kayaking. And I, it was a bit of a moment when finishing my PhD because that's what I really wanted to do. One conclusion was the fact that if I did it for a living, it probably would have become work. But the other one, both my parents were medical doctors. Um, they, uh, aside from being very intelligent and um, to their, devoted to their profession, they both every day really had a genuine desire to help people. I started in mechanical engineering because I liked making paper airplanes. Um, I, I give lectures to incoming um, students in mechanical engineering now, just that they should probably think more about it than I did at the time. But once I got past making paper airplanes, I think it was, I wasn't quite smart enough to be a medical doctor myself. But um, that influence was really what kind of made me want to be in this field, at least of medical technology. And actually, my mother, around the time that picture was taken, got the highest score in the UK on the Royal College of Surgeons exit exam. That was in the late 60s. So from there, I don't know if anyone has been tortured with an abusive elder sibling whom every teacher in your life said they were the best student they ever had, then didn't believe you were related by the end of the term. <laughs> but uh, my sister and my mother, um, my sister at least, there's certainly a positive and negative thing we pull there, but certainly strive my best. That was her at my high school graduation uh, shortly after my PhD graduation. And my mother, of course, she couldn't be here now, she's in the United States. But uh, that was really the guiding influence for all of this. So um, my closing thought of wisdom, if anyone wants to follow that flow chart. And so thank you for your attention. That was terrific. We're running a little bit late, but I guess we have time for a few questions, maybe. We can do that. Is, uh, would anybody like? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about I think we've got a microphone coming. Yeah. Hi. I'm just curious about the ethics around AI and um, prosthetics and things like that. Um, in in respect of are if if say for example you have a prosthetic arm and it's robotic 
and you slap someone, are you still responsible? <laughs> because the law wouldn't cover that as it stands. So, you know, because it's not actually you that's doing it. I'm just curious about that. Well, uh, the legal part, I, w I will have to play the ignorance card a little bit here. Um, I will say, I, with any piece of technology, the people who manufacture it are, of course, to, responsible to the extent, some extent of safety. I was interviewed by the BBC a few years ago on drones, for example. If a drone, say, swipes your car, who's liable? If someone's remote controlling it, things like that. And a lot of this is in new areas. Again, I have to say I'm not that, I don't know a great deal about the legalities of the situation. I can say the medical regulatory authorities are very, very stringent with the kind of tests you do before something is available to the general public. In fact, anyone who is seriously interested in that field, one thing I would urge you to look at day one is how do you handle the regulatory landscape. There is a very, um, I mean, in my opinion, pretty doing pretty reasonably intelligent and common sense regulatory landscape to get a medical device out. So if it passes all those certifications, it's not, unless it passes all those certifications, it's not going to be there yeah. to begin with. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So another question over there, yeah. Yes, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, I've seen several of these robotic um, arms or hands or um, basically prosthetics, and they all seem to um, work off muscle um, movement, um, which seems to be fairly crude. Is there any research being done into um, uh, gathering the, the neural um, information? Uh, for example, you know, you can put one of these sort of caps on your head that picks up all sorts of brain waves and so on. Can you not do the same thing with the, the limb uh, to pick up uh, the neural information and use that? Well, with the caps on your head, um, I've, I've, I've done some things in that field, but it's not my mainstay. So again, I'm, I have to put my disclaimer on it. But the fact is, we have played with those. In fact, we have one PhD student who's trying to study the response when people move specifically to, cert to look at Parkinson's disease conditions that way. The fact is, the caps on the head are, on, on the head, it's very, very challenging to get a reasonable signal that you can do something with. It, it can only, the problem with most of those technologies, there are many things that are trying to go implantable. On this campus, uh, Professor Dario Farina is working with implantable MMG. It is measuring, in theory, the same phenomenon that it measures on the surface, but if you get it inside, it, you can potentially do a little bit more with it. Dustin Tyler at Case Western Reserve is another one who's a pioneer in that field. There are brain implants where um, someone was going uh, at, uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, double amputee controlled a 10 degree of freedom robotic arm with an implant in her brain. The problem, the challenge there, I should say, is the surgeries are not very mature and you are, at the end of the day, drilling a hole in someone's head. Well, no, um, I was, uh, sorry, I was thinking more about using that same uh, technology, but using it on the actual limb so that you would have uh, something on the, the stump, if you like, of the arm that would pick up the nerves when I was trying to do something like that. Uh, to enable that to, to operate the uh, There are the people, there are, there are groups trying to do that. And again, our sensor doesn't use the electrical activity, so right. that's where it might be divorcing itself from some of those drawbacks. But like I said, on this campus, Dario Farina, who's here, I'm lucky enough to have here today, is doing that kind of work. Again, I would say it's measuring the same thing you measure on the surface, but if you get close to the muscle, you can get a better measurement. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, okay one last question there. Question in the middle here, and then we're going to move on because of the time. Yeah. Uh, sir, I just have some uh, question on the research you have done with that artificial arms. Uh, so, because in the in the as a volunteer who losing his whole arms, he doesn't have like the forearm attached to. He doesn't have his forearm. 
but like on the like also in the the, like the demonstration you have done here, we only show the hand and also part of the back limb of the hand, which is the top part. So is there going to any effect on the forearms to affecting how the how the like the system or how the algorithm is to persuade the way of the hand of get hot hand gesture or something else? Uh, I'm sorry. If I understand your question, you were asking, can we get signals from other parts of the arm to channel to something yep. down here? Yep. Um, in Perhaps, it's, it's been done, but the pr there are a lot of practical considerations. Of course, you're moving those when you don't necessarily mean you in, are intending your hand to move. So uh, usually, you're, you're targeting the muscles that would have moved the hand, like what Zenhua was doing here. Uh, it gets, um, when you see a device that's put there, you might have noticed Alex Lewis had a device like that. It wasn't measuring his muscle activity. There were cables there, and by moving his arm, he was getting his hand open and closed there. So there are potentially a lot of places you can get a signal off the body, but for that particular phenomenon, it's, it's not trivial going, some, going anywhere. Usually the target's what the muscles would have been, the closest muscles that were there. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to move on now to the votes of thanks, to plural. We have two votes of thanks. So I'm first going to ask um, Dr. Richard Locke to come up and give a vote of thanks for Ravi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Richard Locke, and I have the pleasure of being able to say that I was Ravi's very first PhD student. Uh, before I go on, I'd like to thank Ravi for a fantastic presentation this evening. Uh, thanks for the questions, and also, as Ravi's already addressed, all of the collaborators that uh, Ravi's worked with over the years to, uh, to give us such a, a fantastic array of, uh, of research topics this evening. So Ravi and I first met in 2007 when I was studying my Master's at the University of Bristol, and I recall our first few meetings uh, and encountering this whirlwind of energy and enthusiasm, and I thought to myself then, this is the kind of guy I could do some research with. Uh, we then embarked on my PhD uh, together, taking inspiration from Ravi's work on biologically inspired multimodal robotics. Uh, and I'm indebted to Ravi for encouraging me uh, throughout this period, uh, as it has laid keystone building blocks in my onward journey as an engineer. Uh, your passion, enthusiasm, your dedication, uh, but always with a good level of humour and humility thrown in. I have very fond memories of our time working together. Uh, where our discussion topics reached far and wide. And I was going to say, and a lesser known fact is that we had shared stories of having shoulder length hair, but as you'll have seen from some of the images this evening, uh, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, our research was far more blue sky thinking, uh, but it's clear that Ravi's uh, research really is helping uh, society as a whole. And I think that's testament to Ravi's character. Uh, his insatiable thirst for knowledge and, uh, and, and progress can really push such a broad range of topics forward. So from biologically inspired robotics uh, through to medical devices and the research that we've uh, heard about this evening. So thank you, Ravi, for inspiring me, many others, and long may it continue so you can help contributing to this world in such a positive way. So congratulations again, Professor Vaidyanathan. <laughs> And now I'd like to invite Professor Payam Banagi to give the second vote of thanks. Uh, I don't know about you, I have never seen a picture of Ravi with long hair. <laughs> Amazing lecture, Ravi. Uh, when we talk about our uh, academic colleagues' success, we often refer to how much grants they had, how many papers they have written. Ravi has all that, and we have seen how his work has touched people's lives, has designed, Ravi and his colleagues have designed new therapeutic solutions, have improved patient outcomes. But the most important thing is our main line of work is education. Ravi is a wonderful teacher. He is an inspiration to his students. On many occasions, I have seen and have worked with Ravi, and I've seen how his, this uh, contagious energy and enthusiasm affects people. He is a wonderful colleague to work with. And uh, I think Ra I met Ravi several years ago, and my first interaction with Ravi, as Ravi speaks, he went through quickly from one topic to the other, <laughs> and I kept, let's Ravi focus on one. He said, yeah, yeah, but I have another interesting idea. Let's talk about this. <laughs> 
And I was thinking, God, this is going to be hard work working for him. And we had a program for five years. I was thinking, this is five years of hard work. It turned out to be one of the most wonderful friends and colleagues I have in academia. Uh, uh, Ravi is very generous. I have tried Ravi in extreme cases. You know, in academia, it's very difficult to keep a balance between your personal life and your professional life. Like, uh, uh, my, uh, I, I guess Utara and uh, Sahana will disagree with me, but I can't imagine seeing Ravi angry. I guess you disagree with me. Uh, 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 but but I've, uh, uh, like Ravi, uh, uh, my understanding is that most of the time, he never misses any of Sahana's sports games. But at the same time, you can actually trust in any time you can call him and ask him for his help. I have tried him in extreme cases, which I thought is going to make him really cross with me. A good example of it, or maybe a good, I don't know whether it's good or not, uh, I tell you, in summer, Ravi and I, we were writing a grant for Life Arc Juana. We put a lot of effort for your grants. Uh, we didn't get it, by the way. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 and uh, it, I mean, there were several uh, issues that which I, I, I mean, I had promised to contribute to part of it, uh, including being lazy. I just didn't deliver. And then 24 hours before the deadline, I called Ravi and I said, oh, Ravi, I'm really sorry, but I can't do this. Uh, I was going on holiday. Uh, uh, <laughs> amazingly, his reaction was, if somebody would have told me, I would have been really angry and cross. I've put a lot of effort and why you didn't deliver your part. His reaction was, he stayed all night, my understanding was, and he interpreted the deadline. He said, they have said, I don't know, Monday. They mean Monday midnight. Nobody can stop us. And he literally worked from 8 in the morning, which I told him I can't deliver, until the midnight to submit that, that, that grant. Uh, he is a wonderful colleague, and uh, I, I thank you for, first for being here uh, tonight. And I, I would like you to join me to thank Ravi for being such an inspirational and wonderful colleague and friend. Thank you, Ravi. <laughs> Okay, so we come to the end of uh, the, the part in this room. We're going to go outside in a minute. Um, and I'd just like to add my thanks, Ravi, for an absolutely wonderful talk. The time went so quickly. Um, so many interesting things. And thank you for all that you do for the department, your important role in teaching and research and in the community in the department. We really value that. This is our time to appreciate it. So congratulations and thank you, Ravi. And thank you very much. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have one more thing. It's, uh, I, um, I lecture students so much on plagiarism, I really need to make a citation here. The title was Uthra's idea. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're good to go outside now for um, the uh, drinks outside. And also, as you'll have heard several times, there are things to play with, I think, demonstrations and so on. Yeah. And if, one demonstration there are a lot of toys outside if anyone's yeah. interested. Yeah.